We are in part three of a series called The Bible. That's right. Very, I'm, I'm very creative with my series titles. Very creative. I'm just a creative person, I guess. The Bible. I know, right? Isn't that every message is out of the Bible? Yes, that's true. But we're talking about the different sections of the Bible in this series, and um, that's what we're going to get into. But first of all, I want to just show you kind of where I'm coming from on this. Second Timothy chapter three says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful Say useful. useful. Man, the whole Bible is useful. I just love that. Useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I love that. I love that so much. And what that means to me and how I'm kind of talking about this, this series is a growing relationship with God means a growing relationship with God's word. If you want to have a growing relationship with God, that means we, we need to have a growing relationship with God's word because he's going to speak to us through God's word. So last week, we talked all about poetry and wisdom. There's, there's poetic books in the Bible. We talked about those, but we also talked a little bit about how one third of the entire Bible is composed in poetic form. That surprises a lot of people, but once you start reading it, you're like, oh yeah, they like break out into song all the time. That's so weird. You can go back and check that out on YouTube if you missed it. I, th I thought it was pretty good. I liked that. I liked that message last week. I was preaching to myself, apparently. Very good. Next week, next week, we're talking about the section of scripture, the gospels. The gospels. Come on, somebody. The gospels. It's like the best section there is. I don't, if arguably, arguably the best section there is, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Why is there four? Why is there's like four, there's like four people talking about how they witnessed this car crash happen, right? And we get four different perspectives. Oh, next week, you're going to really, really love next week. And we're going to break it down. Why is there four? How are they different? What do they mean? The gospels. I'm so very excited about that. But today, today we're talking about prophecy, Oh, okay. You're like, some of, some of you like spiritual people, you're like, about time. Let's, let's get prophetic up in here. Well, hang on. Well, we're talking about the prophetic literature uh, in the Bible, the, the prophetic books in it. But this is, I, this is just my opinion. This is the weirdest section of scripture that there is. And it's the largest, by the way. This is the biggest chunk in your whole Bible. It's like half of the Old Testament is, is prophetic literature and, and arguably the least understood. And for great reason, for great reason. Have you ever had someone come up to you and they like just tell you something that they shouldn't have known about you? They, they tell you something, they're like, oh man, I know you're going through a hard time with this, that, and the other thing. And you're like, looking behind you, like, how'd you know that? And they like read you like a book. Isn't that weird? It is weird. If you don't think it's weird, maybe you're weird. I don't know. Like maybe you, I like kind of like, I think it's weird, but it's funny also how this book can read you like a book. This book can read you like a book. There's no section of scripture that seems less applicable than the prophetic books. Like, okay, thanks Amos for telling us, like famous Amos? No, the prophet Amos, who for telling us about the sins of some city and how it's gonna get destroyed. It's like, I'm so glad I read that this morning. It's so applicable to me. And this, this city that doesn't even exist anymore. Thank you, thank you. It's, it doesn't seem applicable, but I'm telling you right now, uh, to make matters worse, it's like these prophets, they, they, they speak in the past, the present, and the future all at once. It's like, thank you so much for that. Uh, it, it wasn't hard enough to understand. Now it's even more because they're, they're seeing behind, in front, during, and it's like, what are you talking about? How does this, how could this possibly apply to me? It's true. These aspects of prophecy make it really hard to understand, but the fact that all the prophecy that we find in scripture is true and it's proven true, should make us sit up in our seat a little bit and, and look at it and go, oh, okay, all right. If, if this is like predicting the future accurately, then maybe I ought to look at this in a different way. This means not only sh should we not throw out this section in the Bible, but we should take note and lean in. It's the largest category of scripture for a reason, I would argue. It's very, very important to us. So first of all, what is prophecy? What is that what does that word even mean? Like, I'm not going to assume everyone knows exactly what's going on with all that. But prophecy, um, and what we're talking about, prophetic literature, um, these are the, the, the prophecy section is the five, there's, there's two categories. I'm going to get a little teachy, all right? Bible scholars are going to love this. 
you'll be like, yeah, talk more about that. But there's five major prophets, not five major prophetic books, excuse me. And then there's 12 minor prophetic books. And the only difference between major and minor is the length. All right, the minor prophets are like kind of like focused in only on one thing, maybe like five or six chapters. And then the major prophets are like 50 chapters talking about everything, spanning generations. And it's like, it's, it's crazy. All it's, it's just short and long, major and minor. Um, that's, that's what that is. And it's true. Also, it's just like poetry, that prophecy is found in every book of the Bible, not the least of which is the book of Revelation that has a lot of prophetic um, nuance in it, a lot of prophetic, like talking about the future. And it's all the way in Genesis. From Genesis to Revelation, the whole, book, the whole Bible has prophecy in it, okay? So it's not, but we're talking about this section, this chunk. And what is prophecy exactly? And this is in your notes. I want to teach you a little bit first. The first section of your notes is a little bit more. I want you to understand and observe some, some truths in your Bible. And the first is the prophecy is the future revealed. Prophecy is the future revealed. That's what prophecy means. It's just seeing the future and talking about it. Prophecy is a forecast. It's a foretelling of the future. It's never a guess. Watch this. In, in Revelation 22, John wrote this. He said, the angel said to me, everything you've heard and seen is trustworthy and it's true. Everything. The Lord God who inspires his prophets sent his angels to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. Now that is an important, that's an important line. That's an important thing to say. Prophecy is the future revealed so that we can do what? Obey it and then be blessed. That's what prophecy is for is so that we can obey it and be blessed. So we can not just hear the future and be like, oh, that's cool. No, no, no. It's like, it's supposed to give us a warning. Supposed to give us some insight on which way we're supposed to go, what we're supposed to do. If you knew that Disney was going to be worth what it was today and someone told you that 20 years ago, what would you do? You would buy some Disney stock. That's right. If you knew that Google was going to be worth what it is now, what would you do? You would go and I'm answering for you, but if you're not saying what I'm saying, then you're wrong because you want to be rich. So you would invest in that. If you knew what the future was, wouldn't you do something about it, right? If you knew, like, for example, here's another example. If you knew being generous towards God, if you knew being generous towards God led to overflow and blessing in your life, would you do what God had told us to do in regards to the tithe and generosity and all that stuff? If you knew, you're like, well, you know, it's not like for sure. I know. But prophecy is prophecy. And we, we, we read most about this principle in the prophets. And it's prophesying to us, like, this is what's going to happen. It's future revealed. I like to say that obedience leads to provision. Obedience leads to provision. If you obey biblical financial principles, you're going you're gonna to have God's result in your life. Okay, another example. If you knew that knowing God, finding community, discovering your purpose, and then being a lifeline led to fulfillment and satisfaction in your life, would you come to Growth Track on October 6th? <laughs> you would. You see what I did there? Well, it's, it's, it's the future revealed. And, and God has revealed many things to us. And some of it is a little bit more obvious. Some of it's less. And I want to tell you that there is, there's a lot more of the future revealed than maybe you know about. And I want to try to disclose some of those things so that we can obey and be blessed. If you knew that Jesus was coming soon, if you knew that Jesus was coming, would you give your life to him or would you wait and put it off? You see what I'm saying? Like, it's so that we can obey and be blessed. Number two, number two thing about prophecy I want you to know is, is prophecy in the Bible is accurate. It's completely accurate. It's, it's completely, right now, because you might be asking yourself, <laughs> you're asking me in your mind, well, how do I know it's accurate? How do I know it's true? Like, just because you said, preacher boy, yeah. just because you said, pastor, oh, okay, yeah, everything you say just goes. No, 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 no. The Bible informs what prophecies are coming, coming to pass and, and how we should be teaching. That's, that's not enough. That, I would agree with you. That's not enough. If you want to see some evidence, I would be glad to show you some evidence because it would be a great risk, you would think, to put a bunch of guesses about the future in the Bible, hoping it all pans out. You know, if I was building a religion and just like creating the Bible and just writing it, I would make the prophecies a little bit more generic, you know? 
I wouldn't like want to put specific stuff in there because then I, it might be wrong. But the Bible over and over again is putting like very specific things in there. Let me, let me show you this about Jesus. What, what better example could we have than Jesus? But there's over a thousand prophecies found in the Bible, but 300 of them are about Jesus, about the Messiah. 300 prophecies about Jesus. And the last one that was given about him before he was born, 400 years before he was born. That's like a prophecy coming over about right now, like about the election or about something on the Mayflower. That's how long ago that is. That's a long, how much has changed since then? Everything, everything. So the last prophecy that came forth about the Messiah was 400 years before he was born. And it was over an 1100 year period. So these people weren't like, like they didn't have a think tank, right? They weren't like saying, hey, what should we say about him? Uh, 1100 years, generation after generation was, was saying things about the Messiah that was gonna come. And these were not generic prophecies at all. This was like where, where he was gonna live, like where he lived, where he would be born, that he would flee to Egypt, like these are specific things that he would flee to Egypt, that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. The, 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 my favorite one, by the way, my favorite one is King David prophesied about the Messiah. Um, he prophesied that he would be hung on a tree, that he would be crucified. This was before anybody even killed anybody that way. When King David was around, nobody was killing anybody that way. And yet that's what David said was going to happen. That came over with the Romans before Jesus was even born. And yet that's what they say. Like these are very specific, even at the time probably seemed random. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean he's going to be this? I got some scriptures for you. Oh, it's just too much for me. It's too much for me. I'm so excited about this. Psalm 22. Watch this. This is King David writing. King David wrote, my enemies, you tell me who this sounds like. Tell me who this sounds like. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An An evil gang closes in around me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. That means none of his bones were broken. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. Who does that sound like? Who does that sound like? It sounds to me like the most documented human being in all of history, Jesus. The most, not even close, the most documented life that's ever lived was Jesus and David a thousand years. This is 1,000, Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus was born. That's what, you want more? Oh, I got more. I got more. I had to limit myself. This is so exciting. And this is like, um, this is like a hundred years later, I think. Uh, I, I wrote it down somewhere. I can't, I can't remember. But Isaiah 53, this is a very famous chapter about the Messiah. So Isaiah came after, but he also wrote the same thing in Isaiah 53. He said, but he was pierced for our rebellion. Who's he talking about? It's obvious now who he's talking about, but 800 years before Jesus lived, it wasn't obvious because prophecy is accurate and it's the future revealed. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so we could be made whole and whipped. He wasn't just going to be hung on a tree. He wasn't just going to be pierced. He also said he's going to be whipped. Like it's all, it's all, it's all here. It's all here. It's amazing to me. It's hundreds of years later that the Bible is completely accurate. So what I want to show you today is that and I was going to tell you to, to buy this book, and then I looked at it, and it's like two, $300. So don't, you don't need to buy this book. But there is a book. You can look it up. It's called Science Speaks. Science Speaks. And it was written by Dr. Peter Stoner. <laughs> I'm sorry. California humor. <laughs> All right, Dr. Stoner. <laughs> Come on. Stay with me, Lifeline. Come on. He was the chairman in the College of Pasadena. He was the chairman of mathematics and science the chairman of mathematics and science. And what he did is he got 600 probability experts and he wrote this textbook. That's why it costs so much. He wrote this book, 600 probability experts came together and they determined what the probability, the statistical probability would be for one human being to just randomly fulfill all the prophecies that had to be fulfilled for the Messiah. And (laughs) it's, it's pretty crazy that for one man to fulfill just eight, just eight of the prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. I don't know if we got that. Yeah, that's that number right there. That number right there, I don't know if you can see that. um, That's like a number that my son would make up. (laughs) You know, one gajillion, billion, zillion, million, billion. There's probably a name for it. I can't pronounce it. It's, it's, It's outlandish. 
one in 10 to the 17th power. Like at that number, you just have to use powers, you know, because that's, that's what it is. So I, I, I brought an illustration to try and help out with this. Um, I weighed these out, counted these. This is approximately 10,000 10, kernels of corn. And so uh, when it comes to statistics and all that, um, I've got one black one. I don't know if you, can see, you can't see. It don't matter. Just take my word for it. I painted it black. So statistics and probability works like this. You've got one black one. There's 10,000 in here. I put this in here. I blindfold you and say, go ahead and pull that one out. What are the chances that you would pull this one out? One in 10,000. 10, okay. Mathematicians, you've got, you've got that one. Now I've got 10 jars here. I've got 10 jars here. I put one of these in one, I put this one in one of these jars. I blindfold you. You, you dip your hand in there. Come on, math people. What are the chances? 10,000 in one. There's 10 of them here. What are the chances right here? One in 100,000. That's, that's a pretty low chance, right? You want to know how many jars you would need to meet that number? You would need 10 trillion jars. 10 trillion jars of 10,000 each. 10 trillion. That's like, that's like popcorn overflowing. Like you, couldn't even, you couldn't even have 10 trillion jars in this, in this building, from the, all the way to the sides, all the way to the top, it would be flowing over like popcorn. I don't even know how much it would be, but it, that's, a, and one black one for one man to fulfill eight of the 300 prophecies about Jesus. What I'm telling you is, and I got another illustration for you. If, if I, I actually read about this one, but this one might, might work for you a little better. If you had silver dollars, two feet deep across the whole state of Texas, you ever been to Texas? It's big, y'all. It's big, y'all. It's big old, not a tree in it, steak. And two feet deep, whole state. And they fly you around on a helicopter blindfolded for days, however long you want. However long you want. And then you finally say, all right, put me down right here. And you, you get down in there and you pull out the one black one. Eight. What I'm trying to tell you is it takes more faith not to believe. It takes more faith not to believe that this Jesus is who he says he is and that this book is accurate. That, that we can trust. We, we can trust this. But people don't know. They don't know how astronomically impossible it is. There is a term for it. It's a scientific, mathematical, they don't call it improbability at that point. They call it an impossibility. It's a mathematical impossibility that something like that would happen by chance. So for all 300, there's not, there's not language for it. How could this possibly happen? Well, maybe 2 Peter was accurate. 2 Peter chapter 1. You must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding <coughs> or from a human initiative. It's not made up. It's not a guess. It's not a really good guess. It's not like, oh, let's say something that might be. No, no, no. It didn't come from human intuition. No. The prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. It takes more faith to believe that it's random chance and somebody just guessed than it's just, no, God just said to the prophets, he just said to David, this is how it's gonna happen. And he just wrote it out. It's not, it wasn't a chance. He just showed him, pierced, whipped, beaten, hung on a tree, born in Bethlehem, flee to Egypt, all this stuff. He sh they, we, they were shown. It wasn't a guess. That would be impossible. They were shown. So this Bible, I, I hope when you go home today, that you look at that Bible on your shelf and go, it knows. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like it, it knows. It knows what we ought to do. It's useful to teach us what's true. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do. Are you seeing how important this is? It actually knows. Prophecy. That, that section of the Bible. Prophecy. The one that's like, okay, Amos, this is weird. I don't know. Proves to us. That this, that this book can be trusted. Oh man, I'm sorry. It just, it takes more faith not to believe. And you can see why I was so excited for this message coming up because it just, it moves me so much that this isn't just like, well, you know, I guess I'll take a stab at it. No, it actually is showing us. It's showing us. And so the last thing I want you to know about prophecy is this. Number three, prophecy still happens today. Prophecy still happens today. You're like, well, wait a minute. What does that mean? I'll show you exactly what I mean. I'm, I'm saying prophecy not just was accurate, it is accurate. Pr 
prophecy is a gift that Christ gave the church in Ephesians 4. Watch, I'll read it to you. In Ephesians 4, it says this. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets. This is the New Testament church we're talking about. This is Ephesians. He's talking about the New Testament right now church, you and me. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility, what, what's their job? It's the same, it's to equip. It's to equip us. It's to show us. It's to help us. Equip God's people to do good work, build up the church, the body of Christ. And then it says, verse 13, this will continue. It's as if we didn't get it. Like if as if the point was trying to be made over. This is going to continue. This is going to continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we are mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard in Christ. What I'm trying to tell you is God's still speaking. He still speaks. God still uses that, that method, telling the future, showing us the future, giving us insight, saying, no, this is what that means for you. This is what that means for you. God's still speaking. He's speaking to people. He's speaking through people to share his insight. And it's for the same reason as before that we read in Revelation, so that we can obey and be blessed. It's for our blessing. It's for our benefit. Sometimes it's command. Sometimes it's a revelation. But this is a gift that God continues to distribute at his will for the equipping and betterment of his church. Somebody say amen. That's a good thing. It's a good thing for us. So what do we do though? Okay, that's a lot of teaching about prophecy. All right. I, might, I may have proved some things and that's, I hope you're excited to read your Bible and to look at some of these things and go, all right, this is, this is trustworthy too, but what do we do with that? All this is very fascinating, but what does it mean? And this is very, very important. Uh, this could be one of the most important points of the whole day. Number one, I got three, so this is a good one. So hunker down. Accept all prophecy found in scripture. Judge all prophecy from man. Very important. Very important. Because this, this, is, this, this can destroy faith. It can destroy whole churches. It can destroy, it, it, so we need to judge. So, because the Bible is very clear about both. But if it's in scripture, what I'm trying to tell you, it's been scrutinized, it's been vetted, it's been verified, it's done, it's good in the canon of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. That has been vetted, verified, proven. Those 66 books, everybody, we can trust all of that. You need to accept it, <laughs> interpret it, all right? Go for it. Watch Ephesians uh, chapter two now. Ephesians chapter two it says this, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Like our whole faith is built on the prophecy we, we hear here. Yeah. We hear here. I know it was confusing. We hear here. Our whole faith. Amen. The New Testament church is built on how Moses was a prophet and gave the 10 commandments and, and said the tabernacles like this and then other prophets that came. Our whole faith is built on that. But if Jesus gave prophets to the New Testament church, what do we do? We just do whatever they say? Hold on, let's read it. First Corinthians 14 gives us valuable instruction here. Valuable instruction. He says, let, let two or three people prophesy. Let the others evaluate what is being said. Big, 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 big. Because like I said, this is, this is what takes whole faith movements off course and turn them into cults is that we take one little scripture and then a prophet shows up and says, well, we need to add this other book onto this book because the Lord said to me, no, 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 no. Paul taught us, we need to evaluate that. We need to evaluate what's, what's being said because if it goes against what's being written here, mm -mm, we're gonna take you by the belt loop and woo, we're gonna get you out of here. We don't need that. He says, evaluate what's being said. How do you evaluate? So how do you evaluate? True prophecy will be in line with God's word every time, every time. And I don't just mean one verse. I already kind of mentioned this, but I don't, it's going to agree with what uh, Bible teachers would say is the whole counsel of the word. That's what it's called, the whole counsel of the word. So that means if, if a prophet speaks to you or someone's like talking to you, that it's going to line up with everything written here, not just one verse, because you could make a theology around suicide because you could just flip your Bible open and say, Judas hung himself. Well, I know what I need to do. No, 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 don't do that. Don't do that, don't do that. But that's what I'm talking about. It needs to agree with the whole counsel of scripture, the whole counsel of the Bible. The, the Bible talks a lot about two groups of people, very dangerous, false teachers and false prophets. And they're both guilty of the same thing, perverting God's word for their benefit, for their benefit. That's why it's so important for us as believers to be equipped 
and to be reminded every week, every day, that this Bible is our best friend and that this is what we trust. And we trust people too. We trust leaders. We believe in them, but we're going to evaluate what's being said, okay? The good news is there's an easy way to find out what's being taught or, or prophesied about you is accurate. Does the whole Bible agree with the teaching or prophecy, not just one verse? Okay, number two. Number two, what do we do with prophecy? Number two is let prophecy change your direction. Let prophecy change your direction. Okay, so let's get to the meat and potatoes. Let's get into how this actually might look in your life. Let's say you read some scripture. You read some scripture one morning because you're all great Bible-believing Christians and you read your Bible every day. You're on a version Bible plan. Good for you. And you read one morning and something just jumps off the page at you. It convicts you or some current situation and it just, it, it, it checks your heart and you're like, oh, I need to listen to this. Or, or let's say a pastor or a leader or even a godly trusted friend comes up to you and gives you a revelatory word and like speaks something to you that's like direct. Because that's how prophecy comes sometimes. It's very direct. It's kind of pointed. It's specific. When people want to be like a little prophetic or they want, they usually, and they're not really hearing from God, they'll say something like general <laughs> so that they can't be wrong. Um, but let's say someone comes up to you and actually gives you a, like a right now kind of word and says, hey, that, that thing you're dealing with, and then says the thing, you need to do this about it. And you're like, whoa, whoa, you look behind you, like, what? how did you, you get in my phone? Did you get in my phone right now? No, no, but God speaks to people still today. So it could happen to you. Maybe it has. Maybe some of you have stories like that where people have spoken to you. So what do you do if, if a trusted friend and it checks out with the Bible? Like, let's just go on the good side. It's good. It checks out with the whole council of scripture. What do you do? You do what the Ninevites did. <laughs> Who are the Ninevites? The Ninevites are from Nineveh, a place that doesn't exist anymore. But if this is a story from Jonah, which is a minor prophet. And you can sit down and read the whole book of Jonah in like five minutes, and it's wildly entertaining, okay? Jonah, I don't know how to feel about Jonah. Jonah, kind of a jerk. He, re he really is. He's like the first racist prophet I know about. You think I'm joking? It's like he hated God said, I want you to go pronounce judgment on the Ninevites. And he's like, no, God, I don't want to. God's like, why don't you want to? He says, they might change their mind and you'll spare them. And I don't want you to. I want them dead. Whoa, Jonah. Whoa, Jonah. Hold on a second, Jonah. What do you, you want them? You want them what? It's a whole nother message about God can use anybody. But we're not going to talk about that right now because it's, it's a little wild. But let's just, let's just bring you up to speed about Jonah and his thing. And he says no to God. He runs away. He's the, the fleeing prophet, belly of the whale, belly of the great fish. And then he's in there three days. That's a whole other prophetic thing. And then he comes out after three days. And then he finally says, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to go. I don't like him. I hate, I don't like Ninevites, but I'm still going to go. And then Jonah 3 picks up that story. It says, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command, went to Nineveh, a city so large, it took three days to see it all. On the day that Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowd, 40 days from now. See how specific it is? It's like, not like, you guys might die one day. He's like, no, 40 days from now, the city will be destroyed. Nineveh will be destroyed. Next verse. I didn't take any verses out. This is the very next verse. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. He's like, dang it. I knew this was gonna happen. They believed God's message. From the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. You remember I told you that they would put dirt in their hair and then they would wear a burlap sack and that's how they showed everybody they were in mourning. That's what they did, okay? And now I skip some, from the greatest to the least, I skip a couple verses just for the sake of time. Verse 10 says this, when God saw all they had done and put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Why? Because prophecy is meant to change our direction. And they did. And he saved them. And Jonah's sitting over there pouting like, bro, there's better prophets in the world today even. <laughs> there, there are. There really are. Prophecy is not meant to just be fascinating. Ooh, cool. It's like a magic trick. Ooh, I know the future. Cool. Let me show you how, how much I know. Like, I don't know any prophet that would act like that. But maybe you're thinking like, it's just like mystical. No, it's meant to, it's meant to be instruction to us. It's meant to serve as a warning that changes our direction in life. It's like when you're driving to Tahoe and there's that, that curvy road sign. And it says, if you don't slow down, you're going to go off the edge, man. 
and it's usually raining on my way there, and that curvy, that curvy road sign saves my life. Prophecy is like a curvy road sign that saves my life. It's when your spouse says to you, I'm hungry. <laughs> That's prophetic, and it's meant to save your life. <laughs> no, we're, we're called to hear the message from God, hear the prophecy, get the warning, change our direction, and save. it's supposed to save our life. Hear the word, read the word, heed the warning, change direction. Okay, last thing, because it's not all bad news today. Last point, last thing I want you to do with prophecy is this. Let prophecy give you hope. It's not, it's not all bad news. Some prophecy is meant and given and delivered to give you hope and encouragement when you need it the most. Oh, come on, can I know I sometimes, and I've been there, I've experienced this. That way I've been so down and so dark. Y'all think I just been looking like this with my, with my boots and my tucked in shirt doing good all the time? No, I've not been doing good all the time. And sometimes I've gotten a word that said to me, hey, just hang in there. God's gonna meet you in all this. If you hang in there, if you hang tough, watch, he's gonna show up in your life. And that's where some of you are right now. And I wanna remind you of that. Let prophecy, let that word, let the encouragement, let that, let that specific right now word give you hope, give you encouragement. He gives us, he gives the, the, the prophets a message during hard times that he would deliver to you to say, you hang in there. You hang in there. You don't give up now. Watch, there's a, there's a, there's a prophecy that I want to share with you. Very well known, very common, but I want to give you the backstory of it. The backstory is, the Israelites were in captivity. They were absolutely conquered, beaten. They're enslaved in a foreign land, Babylon. Everything was wiped out. They destroyed the, they, they sacked the whole city, burned it down and took all the Israelites in captivity. And that's when this prophecy is coming forth. And maybe you've heard it, but I want you to hear it in that context. They are in captivity. When the prophet Jeremiah speaks this to them in, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And God says to them, in that dark place, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I'll listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. You have to know they were in prison. They were in a foreign land. They were treated so badly during this time. And God is speaking to them, you know? He's giving them hope. And he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to tell them to hang in there. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. I'll be found by you, says the Lord. I'll end your captivity. I'll restore your fortunes. I'll gather you out of the nations where I sent you and I'll bring you home again to your own land. I don't know. Sometimes prophecy is meant to bring us, bring us out of our despair, you know? Bring us out of our hopelessness because, because God knows the future. And the future's not always doom and destruction. Sometimes it's good for you. It's good for your life. God speaks to those who are lost and hurting. If this verse teaches us anything, it teaches us that God speaks to those who are lost and hurting. And God still speaks to those who are lost and hurting. He's still speaking to those who are lost and hurting. I want you to hear that. God speaks to those who are lost and hurting. And he would give you this message. When you seek me with your whole heart, you're going to find me. When you pray... I will listen. He's listening. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he wants to bring his lost children home. Maybe you have lost children. Maybe you are lost children. Sometimes the difference is, are you leaning in to hear what God's trying to speak to you? He's trying to speak to you, but are you leaning in? Or is it hard to hear him in your crowded and noisy life? I know I've been there. My son and my daughter. They might be watching online right now. Love you guys. 
They both came with me on my morning walk this last week for the very first time. It's like 5.30 in the morning. And it was my son's idea first. I got to give him credit. It was his idea first. And I woke him up at 5.30 in the morning and was like, hey man, we're ready. Are you ready to go? He's like, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, crazy. <laughs> I didn't think he wanted to go. And so we go on this walk and it's dark outside, you know? It's dark. It's quiet. There's no traffic. 5.30 is different. And it's, it's, it's a different kind of silent than like 9 o'clock at night. 5.30 is a different kind of quiet. And my son was using his whisper voice. He didn't need to. It's just automatic, you know? Like, hey, Dad, there's a cat under that car. <laughs> he did, and he would. Right? He found every cat everywhere. <laughs> hey, Dad, there's a, there's a bird in that tree. Hey, Dad, I like, how the, I like how the sun bounces off the water right there. He was like using his whisper voice. It's funny how the darkness can silence us. It's natural. The dark, when we're in dark places, we guess our voice goes. What I want to share with you is two things. Number one, God speaks to you in a still, soft voice. You gotta lean in. He speaks. You gotta lean in. You gotta hear him. And I also want to share with you if if you're in that dark place and you're praying in private because darkness silences us so we pray in private we, you know, the unspoken prayers I want to tell you God can hear every word of that because when my son uses his whisper voice I lean into him wow. when you are in darkness and you are whispering to God about those, those things you need those things you want God leans into you because in those days when you pray, I'll hear you. I'm going to deliver you. I believe God is still speaking. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me.